Welcome back. You're watching Stockwatch with me, Simon Brown. Joining me to take your stock-related questions, Sunella Cisvetofili from All Weather Capital, Alex Dace from Thumbo Wolf. Be sure to send through your questions. Email stockwatch at bdtv.co.za, SMS 41392, or on X using hashtag stockwatch. Gents, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, Sunella Cisvetofili, well, let's start with you. And I want to quickly just recap. We got our new cabinet yesterday. Uh, I think the world, certainly South Africa, woke up and thought we were off to the races. Uh, I mean, SA Inks did well. The RAND weakened a whole bunch. I suppose the key point around this is that the turnaround in the South African economy, getting GDP back to 2, 3, 4%, <coughs> this is not going to happen in a week or a month or truthfully even a year. This is a, a, a five-year journey of things hold and, and investors need to anticipate some volatility. Yeah, I think you're right, Simon. I mean, I think there's a few things to consider here. Um, the first one being that, obviously, post-elections, we had a nice rally in the local names. So yeah. perhaps um, people taking some profits uh, after the initial rally. I think the second thing is that, you know, despite all the optimism and potentially increased sentiment around this outcome, um, you know, execution is really where the rubber hits the road. And I, I don't... Uh, <clears throat> know how well the the, the the relative parties will work to, the relevant parties will work well together who well, that will remain to be seen and they'll have to execute and i mean i think if the events of the past week or so have anything to uh, do as an indicator for how they might work together it might show that they might not work that well together given the friction that we saw before this deal was struck so i think all those things are probably kind of factored into a little bit of uh, caution and i think one of the the, suppose the last thing I'll say about it is uh, that, you know, the um, foreigners uh, have been historically a big uh, shareholder base in South Africa. And I think um, at this stage, you're probably still seeing a bit of apprehension from them. And once they start, you know, I guess, dusting off their South Africa handbook and looking mm -hmm. at what's out there, they might be able to then come back into the market, which might give us the next leg of growth and, and um, you know, market activity. Yeah, it is, Alex. I mean, it's uh, it, to a fair degree, it's about foreigners, particularly when we think about the rand. Um, <coughs> if we're looking for a stronger rand, either we need strong commodities or we need foreigners buying our equities and bonds. Alex, uh, the rand is otherwise just doing what it does best, which is be volatile. Yes, good evening. Um, yeah, I concur. Um, I also think a lot of African fund managers have also under owned equities over the last few years. So I think they were the first ones starting to buy over the last couple of weeks. I think that's caused a bit of a rally we have seen. But yeah, to get to the next level, we need for this because they've been pretty much net sellers for the last decade. Yeah. Um, of African equities. So, and for that, even though the market is forward looking, you, you, you know, we know that the foundation is a little bit shaky. Uh, so, time will tell where the friction is and where the opportunities lies and so forth. But I think the key is that, you know, some of the initiatives that has started uh, under President Ramaphosa's previous term, for example, in France and Eskom, that will continue. Mm -hmm. right so that that's positive that will make a big difference you know just need to cut one or two other things for example um if we just see better efficiencies and less corruption that yeah. alone combined with better transnet and s combo will probably give us three percent plus economic growth you don't really need to do a hell of a lot um, and also don't underestimate the change of sentiment because as sentiment changes money flows in rand strengthens that means interest can come down more money in the pocket a bit of a snowball effect also starts coming through so i think we're cautiously optimistic but also realistic about the <laughs> challenges that lies ahead. No, I like that. Cautiously, cautiously optimistic, but realistic at the same time. Let's go to some uh, questions coming through. This one from Leo. Leo's asking around uh, construction stocks. We, we saw them fairly strong today. It is a small sector. Alex, stay with you for a moment. There's not a lot left in construction <laughs> on our JSC uh, over the last 15 years or so. What would be your pick in our, in our very small construction sector, if at all? Yeah, so our general fixed investment in the country has has been way below where it needs to be for emerging markets, pretty much since 2010 World Cup. So we haven't invested in infrastructure, so there's enormous backlog, as we all know. Um, it can, of course, create enormous economic activity as well as job creation. We start doing investment in there. And I think we still got, even though we've lost a lot of skills over the last decade or so, I think there's still a lot of skills in there. And I think the banks would would be certainly be very willing to loan if there's 
incredible projects put on the table. Um, we know, of course, the construction mafia is a big issue. They'll have to try to yeah. tackle that in the administration to some extent. Um, and of course, cement imports specifically was a big issue for uh, cement producers. And now at least we've got a new minister there. So hopefully perhaps some protection can come through there. But within the construction space, I think even though they're not pure construction player, we do like AfriMap. Yeah. And they did recently, of course, the Lafarge deal. Lots of aggregates have got a cement plant as well. We think that's a nice niche there. And and obviously, as well, like the Wilson Valley and Robex has done well. The order books are pumping and uh, they'll probably continue to do well if there's more activity going forward. So rather stick to the quality ones. And, you know, I think some of that has been in ways decimated. But uh, I think those are the three stocks that I'll have a look at. So in the way, I mean, it is, I mean, Afrimat, that Lafarge deal is perfectly timed. I mean, Andres van Heden didn't know what was going to happen, of course, but uh, certainly it has been a, a, a regular fave trading up some, what, 70, mid-70s after 50 rand late last year. Your pick in the in the construction space or picks, if at all? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll agree with Alex on this. I mean, you have to stick to the kind of well-known names. I mean, Afrimat is one that, we, that we've liked. I mean, I think Robex obviously will do uh, uh, quite well as well. I mean, you've seen in the past sort of, I guess, few months, I suppose, maybe 18, 24 months, that Sunrun is starting to kind of uh, pick up again for them. So, you know, doing all the road work and, and stuff like that, that should benefit them quite nicely. So I think if we can get, um, you know, I guess with uh, the new minister coming in, um, you know, more kind of um, activity in terms of capital formation, then, you know, these guys are, uh, I won't say off the races necessarily, but, you know, they, they've got great opportunity ahead of them. And, and staying with you a moment, changing tack, we've got a question coming through around NASPASS, uh, which the, the, the viewer is saying, it's been lagging Tencent, it's been lagging process. We had results uh, Monday of, of last week. Uh, there were a lot of moving parts in there. They're benefiting from selling down the Tencent stake. They're benefiting from cash and earning interest in it. But they are making some progress on, on, on some of their other bets, which are kind of getting to break even. Your take on NASPASS? Yeah, I think, I mean, look, uh, Tencent is still the tail that wags the dog in, in that one. <laughs> um, the discount is still quite um, attractive uh, for us still. I mean, it, it was somewhat surprising um, sort of the, the way that it traded post results. But I mean, <clears throat> I think one of the things we faced maybe today as an example is that you know a lot of the trades that are happening on the market is guys cycling into uh, the local names and out of you know the so-called rand hedges um, you know and Naspers kind of fits that bucket as well and one of the other things that you must keep in mind I mean I know Naspers is a big share and uh, there's a lot of liquid shares in, in, in the JSE but volumes have been light which suggests that you know uh, some of these moves aren't necessarily on the best amount of volume so they will impact the price quite a bit but I think you might be seeing just a little bit of cycling out of the Rand hedges and into the so-called SA Inc. stocks. So, you know, the Nespers, the Richmonds, the BTIs, those will all kind of tend to suffer when, when those trades are, are happening. Yeah, Alex, certainly we saw the industrial sector broadly today uh, coming under a bit of pressure. Your take on, 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 on NASPAS, which still, I mean, there are the bets that are coming to fruition, but it still really is a, a bet on China and, 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 and Tencent. Yeah, we are positive. On that stable, it was actually my stock pick the last time I was on here. Um, you know, since then, I think it's been a little bit weaker. Um, yeah, I, I concur with the views there. So, for me, also, the result I thought was very good. I mean, outlook looks good. Um, we think 10 cents is well positioned. So, we will certainly be see this opportunity to, to, go to, to accumulate. Um, I think if you take a three, five year view, I think the business is very well positioned. Okay, take your point on that. Uh, so let's see where let's come back to you. What about the JSC as a stock? A question coming through from a viewer asking around the JSC. Of course, if we start seeing some uh, 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 foreign inflows, I mean, if, if, the, if the story of the cabinet works, and I appreciate your point that there's a, a long way to go still, is the JSC mm -hmm. opportunity there that just in the sense they could see better volumes coming through? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, the JSC has suffered from has been a lack of volume. So if you look at, you know, the trading volumes in the past, um, maybe even a couple of years, um, you know, I think there was a lot of volume, say, around 2020, you know, the lots of uh, trading around the pandemic coming in, you know, so investors leaving the market and coming back in and, and all of that. And I think there was a bit of a high base there, but then I think there was a little bit of a malaise between then and now. But I think now um, they are looking at an opportunity 
um, if again, this is a big if, uh, if uh, uh, foreign investors do come back in, yeah, um, you know, <clears throat> the company is still on a good sort of uh, trading metrics. I mean, it's got a, uh, I think on my numbers, probably like an eight or nine dividend yield. It's trading on a sort of 11 or 12 PE. So it's very um, attractive from that uh, perspective. Uh, so fundamentally, and still quite a highly cash generative uh, business. So fundamentally, everything stacks up, but we just need a bit of sentiment to come back in. And it is a, it is a, an SA Inc. sort of bellwether as a company. So, you know, it will um, benefit if, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, tailwinds do come to fruition. Alex, uh, JC, I mean, it comes back to your point, you know, cautious but optimistic. Yes, so I think the JC has also done quite a lot of good work in the visifying revenue um, over the last decade or so. It's not only just due to equities and trades and so forth. Um, so, but certainly if the foreigners do come back and we see our daily volume trade improve, there's no doubt they'll benefit. Also, if interest rates remain high for longer, it also benefit from that from the margin deposits. So I think the JC does also cut a lot of costs. Uh, I think the business is relatively well managed, relatively lean just needs a little bit more activity, which we hopefully can see now. I remember for a long time, we barely saw a billion dollars traded on the JSC. Yeah. Some days even half a billion dollars. If we get back to one and a half, two billion dollars a day on average, you know, there's quite sizable upside on the JSC. So a stock that I'm not sure either of you necessarily watch on, but I'm getting a couple of questions on it today because it was up 100 odd percent. Silo Cybin, it, it listed last week. It's a SPAC, special purpose acquisition company in the cannabis space. Is it something that either of you have got deep insights on or can we move on to the next? <laughs> Not from my end. <laughs> Alex, yeah, from no, your end, yes. I, mean, it, 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 I mean, yeah, to the point being is that they've raised a whole lot of capital and I need to go and buy assets. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much they raised. I'm not sure. There is a NAV. You can go and see what the actual uh, net asset value per share is, and that will be underlying cash. Uh, and I suspect it's probably a fair bit less than a 10 round the share traded at today. Gentlemen, let's go to another question coming through around uh, Anglo Platinum. Uh, Alex, let's start with you. I, mean, I, I don't know if, if, if PGMs broadly are on your list, and if they are, if Anglo would be the Anglo Platinum would be the pick of the bunch. The problem they've got, of course, is that parent Anglo American uh, wants to, at some point, uh, exit from this. They're fairly significant. What plus seventy percent stake? Yeah, that's 100% correct. So I think there's two components to it, uh, Simon. So firstly, you have to look at the fundamentals of, of PGMs. And secondly, the, the corporate action that's potentially happening at Amplex. So so even if the fundamentals are in a favor, the fact that there is this corporate action where Ang the Anglo-American, the parent company, is looking to unbundle it, that means it's going to be an oversupply of shares. It most likely it's on forced selling. Um, so as a result, there are some reluctant chill that's currently in Amplex. I think some have already have sold off so they don't want to be in that position. So you know, if you look at it year to date, Amplads has materially underperformed uh, Impala as well as Norwood. Yes, it also um, disappoints operation, but one of the big reasons is due to this corporate activity. Um, but on PGMs itself, it, we are more on the side of caution. Uh, we're not necessarily 100% bearish, but we're also certainly not you know, jumping in at the moment. Uh, we do think that you know, more supply probably needs to come down uh, also, the, the prices of Berlin and Rhone wasn't sustainable. And when you had a, a bubble like we had in Rhodium, it usually then stays meandered for many years. It doesn't make a V-shaped recovery in our view. Yeah. And, and Palladium, of course, also has traded a premium to, to Platinum for about seven or so years. That has come to an end now, and we think that's where it needs to trade. So actually, in our view, we think buying the Platinum ETF is probably a better position if you want to be in that space. But obviously, you don't get the beta or the leverage upwards if stock do rally. So Perhaps a combination of that and the stock. Amplats will not give you the highest beta upward, upward, but due to this relative underperformance, it might not be a bad opportunity. So I would say I'm probably neutral on, on Amplats. Okay, neutral. Uh, so let us see where the, the PGMs broadly, uh, Anglo Platinum in specific, it is a space or spaces you're seeing opportunity? Yeah, I think uh, Alex used the right word, the caution. I mean, I think one of the, the uh, I won't uh, sort of um, <clears throat> repeat what you, you, you said there, but one thing I will mention is that uh, one of the indicators that you might see that the, the market might be in a bit of strain 
is uh, Sibanyi announced, I think, a week or so ago that they will be kind of postponing their slow water operations. So that kind of gives you an indication that, you know, something yeah. needs to be done on the supply side to kind of help, uh, you know, mitigate the, the kind of uh, struggling uh, prices of, of sort of the, the whole basket, basically. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the PGM companies need to um, <clears throat> uh reduce supply just to to make sure that you know they, they keep the market in, in a better balance and i think uh, you need to be a bit more cautious while there's still uh a bit of jostling around i guess amongst all the companies i have to take your point on that neville's asking about the closing auction uh neville to keep it quite simple 10 to 5 we go into closing auction you place bids and offers to buy or sell nothing matches until five o'clock at five o'clock the price at which the biggest volume is going to happen will be that closing price. You might have placed a buy order at 10 Rand 50, but you might actually get it at 10.30. So you might get better either way. But it's that jostling for that final five o'clock. And then it is where, where's the biggest volume? At what price point does it happen? And that then gives us the, the, the closing price. Uh, so nearly see where, let's stay with you. What about Telcom? I mean, this is... Oh, I mean, I, I, I've been in the markets long enough to remember when Telcom was a, well, it used to own a, a large stake in Vodacom. It was a, a, a what, 180 odd rand stock. Uh, they've got rid of, of, of SwiftNet, uh, but the market didn't seem overly thrilled. Is there opportunity? Is there value lurking in, 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 in Telcom? So no doubt Telcom is cheap from our view, <laughs> but I think there is um, <clears throat> uh, perhaps a, a lack of a clear kind of strategic direction. I mean, it's a highly competitive uh, industry. There's there's sort of uh, a lot of price pressure, uh, and also you know you've got to deal with a lot of regulation, and of course there is the race for I guess um, you know data, you know with uh, Telcom trying to buy um, rather MDM trying to buy Telcom and that deal falling through more yeah. or less, and you know um, Vodacom's got their their, their deal with um, <clears throat> with CIBH. So I think Telcom might just be as the third player be stuck in a bit of no man's land. I think generally when Telco markets mature, there's sort of a top two kind of a dynamic with um, perhaps a third or a fourth, but being marginally profitable. So I think Telcom is stuck in that uh, space. And then there's obviously a bit of a CapEx bill attached to these guys uh, sort of across the sector. And I'm not sure how well Telcom might be able to kind of uh, uh, manage all of that. Uh, they've done a few things to unlock uh, value or kind of just to, to try to kind of um, to, to do uh, generate cash flows. But I think in a, in, in a again, in, a, in the telco market, you're probably looking at the top two players and telecom is kind of stuck in, in you know, stuck behind the, the two major players. Uh, but like I said, it is cheap. So if you can sort of, um, I don't know, be uh, an activist investor, perhaps <laughs> uh, coming in and, and trying to uh, to get some change within the uh, the, the, the team they might get some value yeah and it is i mean alex i mean telco's mobile is, is just i mean capex we currently what 5g we know that 6g is coming at one point alex your take on on, on telecom yeah um <laughs> if, if we were able to be an activist investor on the value there could have been something but of course government's a big show though right so that's unlikely to happen yeah, and I think if any activist says best of ones come in there, I can guarantee you government or PIC will build up this. Um, so that's not going to happen. Uh, I think the balance sheet is looking a lot better now, post the SwiftNet deal, and I think some of the existential crisis risk they had perhaps 18 or so months ago is perhaps not as bad now. One thing I do want to highlight is we do have, of course, a new communications minister, mm -hmm. and we know Spectrum has been a major issue quite some time now. So hopefully things can get a little bit moved on there now. Um, and that perhaps could be a nice year for not only for the telecom stocks, but also for SA economic activity. Um, and I, I think that problem I have if the, if BCX, if they can sell that business or exit completely, I think it will also unlock some value. That business is in the highest trade, it's going backwards in alarming rate. Um, and I think they will, that for them to have a cleaner structure, they will probably need to get rid of it or at least get an equity partner. They've actually postponed that for now. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. You know, you see a lot of optionality, but at the same time, we've been burned so many times before, and you see a, <laughs> a lot of headwinds as well. So, you know, I, I, I probably would sit on the sideline mode. So let's stay with you, Alex. Question coming through around preferred education stocks, of which there's Advertech, uh, of course, Kuro and uh, Stadia. It's all same but different. Have you got a, a preferred in the space? Is it a, space, a sector that you particularly have interest in? 
Yeah, so perhaps uh, briefly on, so we do like both Stadio and Avitech. So on Stadio, um, obviously the, the focus there for them is uh, distance learning. So think about this as a, as a big UNISA type of play. So you've got a very incompetent or weak uh, majority player there, which is, makes it easier for you to get market share. Mm-hmm. There's some headwinds there, for example, they need to get NASA's funding and so forth to really accelerate growth. But we do think they're well positioned. And also, it's not capital intensive. So the J curve is a lot shorter when it comes to that the business compared to schools. We have to build a big infrastructure and so forth. Um, so Stadio, we think actually going to generate good cash and pay good dividends down the line with good growth prospects. We like that business. Um, and then Advertech as well. I mean, they have done very, very well. So the expansion to Africa, surprisingly, is working quite well. Yeah. Got a coordination of tertiaries as well as schools. Um, so we think the well position. Oh, However, I want to highlight that they've lost both their CFO and CEO recently. So a lot of institutional memory has gone there. So, you know, I'll perhaps a little bit cautious just to see what the new management team strategy is going to be. But other than that, that business is, is pumping. It's generating very really good cash, good growth prospects. We like it. Uh, Kiro also good. Um, uh, since the new management has come in there, they focus a lot more on efficiencies, which we like. Uh, you're going to see improvement in EBITDA margins, better capital allocation, improvement in ROEs. We think the unlock value and I think the share price has already showed that to some extent, but they do have that negative that they have to spend a lot of money on capex and affordability is a bit of an issue there because we tend to cater more for middle class where we know they are in immense pressure in South Africa. Uh, so now you see where we need to quickly go to you. I need to stock picks, but your, your, your pick in the education space? Yeah, I think uh, that's laid it out quite well. So I think the one thing I'll say is just that um, we have a preference, obviously, for Stadio. I mean, mm-hmm. I think the main thing there is just, just around the capital light model. I mean, I think, you know, they've got a target to reach, I think, 55, 56,000 students by 2026 or 2027, and then ultimately 100,000 students by some later stage. And I mean, because it's so capital light, I mean, they're already kind of in the teens, I think 12 or 13% ROE. Yeah. And I think it can it can touch sort of 20% if they can, uh, you know, get the, the student numbers through the door there. So de- depending on how far they go, you know, I don't want to say the sky's the limit, but there's certainly a decent amount of upside in kind of generating a higher return from that business. So I think Stardew is a good pick. Yeah, I take your point on capital out. And certainly they're, they're kind of almost the UNISA of, of the new age of UNISA. Well, those kids who want to get into VITS and UCT yeah. and can't because there's just not enough desks. They have to go somewhere else. Uh, so, Nina, see where let's stay with you for your stock picks. You're going SA Banks broadly. You're not picking a bank. You're saying SA Banks, which weirdly is not the Finney 15 because, of course, that's good insurers and REITs as well. But yeah. you're liking the banks. Yeah, I think uh, given sort of the, the new dawn, if I can call it that, for South Africa. Uh, if it sticks, you know, uh, all the activity that's going to come through, you know, all the funding that's going to be needed, you know, the banks are, are likely going to benefit from that. I and mean, I think rates have remained high for uh, longer, higher for longer, as they say, mm-hmm. and that's going to obviously benefit their interest line. <clears throat> I think uh, banks across have done generally well in maintaining their costs as well. Um, and I think, uh, you know, obviously you, you, you kind of get your, take your pick there. I think my pick... Uh, in the banks would be sort of first rand as, as the quality play, um, you know, net bank as the kind of value play, if I can call it that, um, you know, but I think the banks generally will do well um, in an environment where SA Inc. is doing well. Yeah, and I take your point. The one thing which has astounded me over the last two or three years is those cost to income ratios, which I thought, I mean, they, they, they got them down way more than I thought was practical in the current mm-hmm. environment. Alex, you're going with a uh, good old fashioned Remgro. Yes, so I think, you know, we spoke about foreigners and so coming. If they do come in, uh, I think Remgro would, would be one of those stocks they're going to buy. So it's about 38%, I call it close to 40% discount now, which I think is, is very enticing entry point. And the key for me is they got a lot of portfolio investments uh, in, in Discovery, First Rand, Momentum, which are recently exited. And for me, that is where the opportunity lies. I think there's a lot of potential dry powder, a lot of potential corporate action. And with this rally you've seen, specifically in stocks like Discovery, as I just alluded to, they could be looking to exit these stocks now and do something with it. Rainbow Chicken, of course, also spun out of, of RCL. They currently mm-hmm. Rainbow owns 80% of those shares. So, you know, and then they've got, you know, what are they going to do with the ramp of RCL, et cetera. So I think there's quite a lot of potential economic um, corporate activity for them to unlock value. And the stock is looking cheap. And I think the underlying growth prospects looks better. And foreigners will love it as well. So for me, it's a good entry point. 
Yeah, actually, I've forgotten that they're in such a giant stake of the RCL, so they're now holding that, that uh, it's significant same giant stake in uh, Rainbow. But that's it for tonight's stock watch. Thanks to our guests in the Seaware, to Fila from uh, All Weather Capital, going with Banks, first round in Nedbank, the two. Uh, Alex Dace from Thumbo Wealth, going with Remgo. Up next, the close. Stay tuned. Thank <laughs> you.